particularly in, in my profession, building the building profession that is the the, um, the extraction of resources to create building materials, the, the, to build uh, buildings, to operate buildings, um, they consume 40% of the world's energy. That's more than the transportation industry, the more than the uh, oil extraction industry, uh, all other industries basically. So alone our industry, and we actually have the technologies to change this dramatically, uh, more so than any other industry, uh, to make a profound change on uh, the planet. I also teach at the uh, Institute Without Boundaries, which is an interdisciplinary design program, graduate program at George Brown College. And um, young students, uh, usually with an undergraduate degree and who have been participating in the workforce for some time, come together from all over the world to join this program. And the program includes industrial design, architecture, urban planning, uh, product design, engineering, uh, a number of different disciplines um, in order to develop a, holistical, a holistic approach to design and the impact of design in the world. And um, it, when, when they're being interviewed uh, as to why they want to come to this program, they all say one thing in common. They want to make a difference in the world. Uh, have been part of this, this uh, incredible drive to achieve uh, human perfection, rid the earth of poverty, disease, uh, hunger, all those kinds of things. So there's a wonderful uh, goodness, if you will, intentionality about how we've used our technologies to improve the condition of humans on the planet. However, what we have only recently begun to appreciate and understand is the shadow side of that zeal and uh, movement towards uh, achieving that goal. And that is that ultimately, in order to achieve that goal, uh, we, we have to depend upon an extractive economy that looks at the earth solely as a resource, as a limitless resource indeed, and so only now that we're beginning to understand the, the limitations of those resources, um, and, in order to feed our industrial processes. And to make matters worse, we uh, also look at the earth uh, in terms of its atmosphere, its soil, its water, to absorb the industrial waste byproducts of those same technologies. And uh, the Earth has been treated, as, as I said before, as an externality in our financial equations. Uh, one of the most compelling stories that I um, heard uh, to kind of illustrate this idea is one that um, David Suzuki shared at a conference I attended, a green conference that I attended. And he was um, uh, very uh, actively engaged in working uh, and struggling and arguing with um, companies like Macmillan, Lodell, um, who were cutting down the old growth forests in Canada um, uh, to um, create toilet paper and uh, the paper we we're writing on and, and that sort of thing. And um, in his in his conversation, the president of, of Macmillan, Lodell, stuck his finger at, at David Suzuki and said, "You do you, you don't get it. You don't understand." Those trees have no value until I cut them down. So in other words, he saw the forest simply as so many board feet of lumber that would create housing, would create uh, furniture, paper, whatever we need to feed our economy. And David Suzuki kind of, you know, uh, hit his head and said, well, of course. I mean, he's coming from a completely different worldview than I'm coming from, which is looking at the forest and understanding it as uh, sort of a, a primeval, primordial, like, you know, predating human existence in this area, perhaps, as an ecosystem, as the lungs of the earth, as supporting habitat, as um, a, a carbon sink, as, um, um, you know, the, the breeding grounds for any number of species of birds and animals and plants, and, and so it's a completely different way of seeing things. So Thomas Berry, the, my mentor, would say that as humans, we become autistic to the voice of the earth. In other words, we failed to, we've been so focused on ourselves that we failed to pay attention to um, the voice of the earth. So, as I said, it's all a question of worldview. So, and, and, and there are many scientists and uh, from my discipline, theologians and architects who are beginning to realize that our traditional view is, worldview is no longer functioning properly. If we truly are going to create a sustainable future, we can get there with the same worldview that got us here in the first place. Um, my criticism, I'm a member of the Green Building Council, a lead accredited professional. 
uh, most of my colleagues are so still focused on basically ways of ameliorating the same in, in, in a way that enables us to, to maintain the status quo. So it's a bit like creating a hybrid car. It doesn't really solve the problem. It just means that we'll be using less gas, perhaps, than uh, we use now. But ultimately, we're still being dependent upon gas, right? which is, which is a, a finite resource. So however, having said that, the, the, the amazing thing about the scientific Western tradition is uh, out of this historical worldview, because it developed the technologies to look at the universe and, and begin to understand what, how the universe was born, how it has evolved in its 14 and a half billion years of existence, um, uh, they've been able to create a, a, essentially a new cosmology, a new way of understanding creation that is based on uh, an understanding of the universe as cosmogenesis. And what that means is that uh, the old worldview understood the universe as having been created at a single moment in time and is, is, is unchanging and is here. And um, any of our you know, Western um, biblical um, cosmologies reflect that understanding. Right? But their understanding now that the universe in its uh, original bursting forth 14 and a half billion years or so ago, it's continuing to uh, grow and, and expand and emerge and self-educated, um, uh, is a self-educating entity, which is a dramatic departure in the way we understand <coughs> the universe and, and its impact on us as humans. So this is um, a, a new Catholic church that was um, uh, finished in 2006. It won the Toronto Green Design Award. It was the first lead building in uh, Toronto, um, or lead gold building in Toronto. Um, it, um, uh, I guess the first thing you might say is that it doesn't look like a church. Right? I don't know if there are any Catholics in the audience, but most churches have a peaked roof and a big steeple. Right? This has neither. And, and interestingly enough, we worked very closely with our engineers to, um, um, to uh, articulate the best way to create a sustainable building. And in so doing, that began to create the iconic uh, image of the new church. So the canopy and the um, uh, huge floor-to-ceiling, wall-to-wall glass become the new icons of uh, or new typology for church uh, um, uh, moving into the future. So this is an interior view in winter time of that glass wall. And what you'll notice is that we're harvesting um, free energy from the sun. So the canopy is designed, the size and angle of inclination on the canopy is designed to harvest the sun's energy between the fall equinox and the spring equinox. And to shape the building naturally during the summertime when you're in cooling mode. Okay? And uh, the concrete, which was used as the structure of the building, um, is also the interior finish of the building. In other words, we didn't add, we didn't use more reverse resources to cover up the structure like 99% of all buildings built in Toronto. We actually allowed that structure to be the finish and give expression and serve a purpose. By leaving it, 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 it acts as a heat sink, uh, as a, a thermal sink to absorb that heat energy, store it, and then radiate it back out into the space at night when the temperatures drop. So the idea from a theological perspective is that the sacred space of the worship, where we're gathering to worship, is seen within the greater context of creation. In other words, equal value has been given to the, to the natural world as it has to the built environment. So in other words, um, what's happened here is we've created a sense of a sacred access that uh, includes the traditional elements of the Catholic Church, like the altar and the ambo, where they uh, do the readings, and the seating arrangement is framed to, to create that sacred access that ends in the garden. So in other words, it says something about how we value the natural world. Most churches use stained glass to isolate its participants from the, from the outside world so that we can create an otherworldly atmosphere to connect with the transcending God. This church is all about the horizontal, about connecting and understanding that creation is the primary revelatory experience of the divine. So in other words, everything I need to know as an architect, everything I need to know about God, everything I need to know about an engineer, I can learn from you. Uh, in 1995, uh, I wrote a paper and presented a paper called The Earth is Primary Architect. It's followed up the next year with The Earth is Primary Educator. And I think that's something that we're all forgetting, is how much we can learn from um, uh, natural processes and, and natural technology. Um, so I encourage you 
to nurture a love of the natural wild earth in yourselves and in your children. Uh, when they want to learn about frogs, don't send them to their computers. Send them to the woods and to the frog pond because there's no comparison. Uh, also, question all of your presuppositions, beliefs, and values. I tell my design students at IWV that from the moment you wake up in the morning to the moment you go to bed at night, you are making design decisions that have an impact on the world. Okay? And then I just want to leave you with two inspiring, if you're feeling a bit overwhelmed, two inspiring notes uh, that I read from a woman who devoted an entire book to crows and what she learned from crows in an urban environment, which I found very, very fascinating. They're incredible engineers and we have lots to learn from them. She says that hope is that virtue by which we take responsibility for the future, not just responsibility for our individual futures, but also for that of the world. Virtue is the power to realize good, to do it joyfully and with perseverance, in spite of obstacles, and I think we're challenged to do that. So uh, I would, as you leave this conference, I would beseech you then to live towards the realm of possibility, to a life dedicated equally, not only to yourselves and your families, but the other than the human world. Thank you very much for your attention.